Welcome everyone. Hi. Hi, Jen. How's it going? Good, thank you for joining us. Thanks you for posting this. I'm gonna stop my video because I'm doing various RV tasks. Oh, sure. Feel free to either drop a question in the chat or to just unmute yourself and ask a question. This is really led by the questions people have here, so don't be shy about speaking up. So we were just talking about that family down in Mariposa on the Merced River that uh, all dropped dead on a trail, the Savage Lundy Trail, after getting close to uh, a river with known toxic algal bloom. I mean, the, the sheriff released his statement. They're blaming hyperthermia. Hyperthermia. Three people, I mean, two, two adults, experienced hikers on an eight-mile trail, drop dead, their baby with them, their dog, same place. The sheriff says that in 20 years uh, working in that area, he's never heard of any case of hyperthermia like this before. And here, they're, they're telling us to believe that, you know, a, an entire family and their dog all drop in the same place from hyperthermia? Well, you know, this reminds me very much of the Lake Tahoe outbreak because um, we, were go we were having plumes. We were having like toxic plumes of the stuff that would just lash out and knock me flat. And I can see where if I had run into that stuff, it would have diminished my capacity to make it home so severely that I could have dropped into hyperthermia but it wouldn't have been the hyperthermia. It wouldn't have been the, the dry conditions that did it to me. It was definitely that exposure to the anatoxin A, the uh, microcystin, that set me up for failure. And I'm not the only person during the Tahoe outbreak who reported that either. Eric, did that article, it specifically said anatoxin A and then they said it wasn't found in their systems. Is that, is that right? Well, it may be that they're looking for a fairly high level in the blood as if it were ingested. But you, you could tell by the way that they described it that they weren't thinking of inhalation and they checked the Camelback uh, water pack that they were carrying and there was some residual water left in it. Now, if they were suffering from hyperthermia, they would have drained that sucker dry, wouldn't they? But they tested that water and found that they didn't draw water from the creek. There was no anatoxin A in the water. And I believe that from that, they just extrapolate that, well, they weren't drinking it, so therefore that wasn't the problem. And they're not aware that this stuff can actually get into the air as a toxic plume and mess up your breathing so bad that it'll <coughs> drop you in your tracks. So you think that's where the, where the disconnect and understanding is that they're not comprehending that something in the environment can be inhaled. So they're recognizing that, hey, this toxin's present, and that's it. Exactly. Um, and that's the same parallel situation with mold. All these years they've been saying, oh yeah, it's toxic, but you would have to ingest it. You'd have to eat large amounts of toxic mold. And they're completely ignoring how the lungs have very little de defense against this kind of threat. And if you're in a vulnerable spot, say you're, you're having a flu-like illness or there's something else going on in your life and this weakens your lungs, these other pathogens can get out of control or whatever toxic exposure. Say you uh, inhaled a little bit of the stuff and then went to the gas pump, all of a sudden maybe the diesel or the gas fumes might drop you in your tracks. But what do you blame? You blame the gas fumes rather than what set you up. I think we see that all the time in different situations where people are always pointing at the one thing that bothers them, but it and might now, be the agent. Just recently, we uh, seen a flurry of articles about harmful algae blooms where they're saying, yeah, we're finding this stuff in the air. That's new. They didn't used to think that. 
for years, they always said, oh, no, you have to, the dogs would have to jump in the water and drink a bunch of it. Well, that's a bunch of crap. If you look in Dr. Shoemaker's book, Desperation Medicine, about the um, outbreak of Fisteria on the Chesapeake, all of a sudden the people lining the banks, all that real estate was going up for sale. People were getting sick. They realized that just being near, near the water was enough, and they were bailing out. So clearly, if you listen to patients, if you listen to these anecdotal experiences, there's something in the air, and scientists haven't been picking up on this. I think this, this also ties into one of the biggest things that they use in, in court to try to cast out onto mold sufferers claims, the, the inhalation aspect. We have, a, we have a question from Jen. Eric, and it's directed to you, it says, in Eric's opinion, what does a lifetime look like for young kids who got CIRS, did mold avoidance, got better, but now have to be careful and also have the added awareness that mold illness comes with? What changes can they hope to see and hope to ignite in their lifetime? So two different questions there. Well, they can certainly raise awareness of this as a distinct entity and illness that needs to be looked into. But what does it look like for somebody who becomes sensitized at an early age? Well, I don't have to look any further than the original chronic fatigue syndrome cohort, the students at Truckee High School, because I kept track of them. These were my friends and they were sensitized for life. Wherever they went, they had to watch out because the mold was affecting them. They may not admit it, and they may not, they may have been at a point where they could kind of go on with a normal appearing life, but I could see where it was affecting them. And my best friend in high school moved to Berkeley of all places, and I went down to visit him, and it was obvious that the mold in Berkeley was tearing him to pieces. Oh no. Um, but now I have to be careful. But on the other hand, if you know about it and you make allowances, you can vastly improve your life. So maybe you don't have to be as miserable as a lot of us who droned on year after year, not being aware that that toxin is really affecting us as much as we say it is and not in the minimal way that doctors believe. I think a successful mold avoider develops radar to the point where they can say, this is bothering me. And I have talked to people who have done mold avoidance and they still say they're like sick with all their symptoms. To me, then you haven't, then you kind of miss the mark of what mold avoidance is because you've never got clear enough to say, I don't feel good here, so I have to stay away from here. Well, the other thing is we can't really say, think of this like an allergy where you get out and you're gonna go back to 100%, you're gonna be terrific. These are neurotoxins, there's gonna be some damage. And in the military, I was told that, yeah, you could survive a low level nerve gas attack, but you will never be the same you will be chemically sensitive from then on. So you probably have to live in a glass bubble for the rest of your life. And it seems that at a certain level of mold illness, that is exactly what people are describing. Um, can I just jump in with more information about my question? Because this is really helpful. Um, Eric, I've, I've never met you in person, but we've been doing mold avoidance for two and a half years with um, my kids were sick and they're better now. But I want to know like, as their parent, what's the most important thing that I can give them? And I think it might be an awareness of their environment and then an interest in the science behind this. So maybe they can make changes in their lifetime. And I'm just wondering what you think. Yeah, well, as you say, to raise awareness and to get interest in the science, but even more important is to trust yourself, trust your perceptions. I mean, number one, if they go into a moldy school, they have to take the responsibility on themselves to realize just how badly it's affecting them and be very forceful about taking action 
because as you see, if you try to explain it to authorities or doctors, they're not going to take it seriously. They're not going to believe you. So if you really want to stay on top of this thing, you have to rely on yourself. And if you feel a mold hit, believe it, trust yourself. Yeah, totally. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's going to be the way of the future is that kids are going to have to learn that they're not kidding about this, that given their personal susceptibility, they have to take action. It is vital that they do so, and they need to be forceful enough to stand up to adults and get out when it's necessary. Yeah, mine are homeschooled for this reason. I'm just not ready to have them be exposed to that. We can keep it safe at home, but outside of that, I don't think we can guarantee anything. If society will give us a little slack, you know, cut us some, some leeway here, uh, there's so many cases where a child can learn that a certain part of a school or a certain room is bad, but the rest of the school's okay. Totally. And, and if they will make allowances for that kind of susceptibility, you can go on and have a fairly normal appearing life, but just for those one instances where you walk into a bad place or a storm came in and it's a really bad day and you need to get out of there, you, you need to be given the freedom to be able to do so so that you don't get permanently ill from it. Yeah, I'm going through this with my oldest son right now. He's in a middle school that feels bad everywhere to me and he's sinking into more fatigue and sadness and anger and we're kind of scrambling and looking at private schools um i just pulled my middle um, my youngest out of the elementary school because he just he went backwards with like neuropsychiatric pans pandas type symptoms and um, bladder issues so the, the issues at the school is if it's just one room, maybe you can avoid it. If it's the whole school, less so. But um, the biggest thing I would say that I learned from Eric is that, um, you know, it was hard for me to wrap my head around the fact that, like, mold didn't always, like, throughout all of history, just start attacking these people this to this degree. And so I always try to keep, like, one eye on, Eric's overarching theory, because I think you, you, you have to, to be solution-based. Otherwise, you're just kind of putting a Band-Aid on things. I don't know if you want to talk about that, Eric, a little bit. Alicia alluded to it a little bit in her comment that said, we're moving towards a future where more, more people will become sick, as Eric has observed, mold illness has definitely exploded. Well, remember that back in 1985, toxic mold hadn't even been discovered yet. It wasn't even in the literature. <laughs> and how mind boggling is that, that we've gone from something that wasn't of sufficient concern that people are saying, wow, this, this black moldy stuff, I mean, it's really, really bad and we ought to pay attention to it, to everybody having a mold story, so many sick people now in just 25 years. I mean, that's clearly a warning that something has changed. For myself personally, I had, I'm just gonna say this to the group, I had the hardest time ever wrapping my head around the fact that mold could be behaving differently now than it had been before. Um, sorry, the kids got up from there now. And I think, um, I don't know if, if everyone here is kind of familiar with Eric's, Eric's theory, but it's, it's that um, other, other pollution, some natural pollution and also man-made pollution is, is helping in microbes like fungi and bacteria process nanoparticles and, and that's making it, go ahead, Eric, do you wanna jump in here? Oh, sure, well, yeah, you know, during the Tahoe outbreak when so many people got sick on the north end of Lake Tahoe, we were going wild looking at everything we could think of, what could possibly cause thousands of people all in this one geographic area to have flu-like illness, fatigue, inability to control viral infections, just vague, weird symptoms. And I mean, up in the mountains, 
you've got a limited number of variables. We don't have industry. There were no pesticides being applied. There, there really wasn't much of anything that had changed, except there was this algal bloom. That was new. We hadn't seen that before. That was kind of unusual. And what could set off an algal bloom? What, what could uh, affect the, the, the microclimate in the Lake Tahoe Basin? Well, it turns out that the ski resorts were just blasting us with silver iodide uh, ultrafine particles. They were using the cloud seeding to attract all the moisture out of there, get as much snow as possible. And we thought, could this be possible for the environmental changes? And when they explained to us what these ultrafine particles, these nanoparticles were doing, is when they disperse them into a cloud, they create a, a locus of nucleation for more nanoparticles so that the attractant quality of the particle will draw in more and more stuff, more water droplets, water vapor, until it becomes heavy enough to fall out of the sky as rain or snow, hopefully snow. But what was that nucleus? That's a heavy metal. That's the, this toxic silver particle. We know that silver is an antibiotic. It's, it's a powerful antimicrobial substance. What's this going to do to the environment? So that's where really they explained to us at the very beginning of the Lake Tahoe mystery illness that we're going to douse you with particles that have the capacity to attract garbage out of the air, including acid rain, including all the pollution from the San Joaquin Valley. I mean, any unnatural thing that's in the air, it's gonna be attracted to this nanoparticle and it's gonna fall right on your heads. And we were not in favor of this. I mean, if the solution to pollution is dilution, we'd much rather have it diluted over the rest of the United States been concentrated on our position. As far as we were concerned, dispersion of these nanoparticles was going to be concentrating toxins on our location, and we were not pleased about this at all. When we tried to protest, they said, well, yeah, they're harmful. Of course, they're antimicrobial, they're toxic. If you put silver iodide particles, nanoparticles, into a bowl with goldfish, it'll kill them but it won't kill you because it will be so widely dispersed. It will be highly diluted. Well, how do you know that? How do you know that this isn't gonna concentrate in the streams, run down to a central location and affect some microbes or affect some people who are drinking the water? They go, well, you have no studies proving this. So until you do, we don't even need to file an environmental impact report on this. We're just gonna go ahead and do it. So that's where the idea came from, that the nanoparticles were combining with pollution and concentrating themselves. And this seemed like a reasonable enough, I mean, to me, partial explanation. Up until I read about nanomedicine in the uh, early 2000s, they started using nanoparticles as vectors for transport of medicine into the blood and brain. And the first time I saw that, having this background of being scared of nanoparticles already, I thought, oh my God, that means that these toxins that are adhered, sticking to these nanoparticles, they're not just getting into the, uh, the water and affecting things in an ambient way. They could actually go right through your lungs, into your blood, sail into your brain, and cause an immunological response. We know they do this because nanomedicine proves they do. They do. That's how nanomedicine works. So if we're aware that this effect can take place in the laboratory, in a doctor's office, when they use these medicines, who's to say that these nanoparticles out in the wild, these unaccounted ones, the ones that they're not monitoring, the ones they're not even looking at, who's to say that these are doing the exact same thing that a nanomedicine does, but in an uncontrolled environment. And this was actually, 
it's comical at this point. <laughs> How much I butt heads with Eric on this point because I really, at that time, for the longest time, couldn't wrap my head around that theory of yours, Eric, as I've told you 500 times now. <laughs> and I also couldn't wrap my head around the fact that like, there could be an effect in any environment that would change mold's behavior. And even though this house and this location hasn't been perfect for us, it was moving into this house that really helped me wrap my head around and connect more with Eric's theory because we have an oven range that's like a flat top and apparently there had been like an old spill in one of the cabinets. There was no fungal growth. I couldn't smell any mildew or anything, but it was a shared cabinet right like kind of attached to the stove. And anytime I used the heat to cook anything, there, there, something happened in my kitchen that made me not be able to be in there. Like I felt like immediate panic attack, immediate heart attack. And it would be only, it would be way intensified when I used the stove. And then it got to the point where it bothered me even when I wasn't using the stove, but not to that level, to the point where we actually, I would talk to Eric about it and he'd explain, like he kind of used that as a teaching moment to help me understand. We ended up ripping the cabinet out and it, definitely changed how the kitchen felt and it was really that experience of like this is here when the oven's on something's happening that makes it feel different and I trust my response to know that something's not right but if I hadn't had you to talk through with that I think maybe to this day I would just think that I was crazy or having random panic attacks it's like how do you make sense of what you feel when it's just been normalized as another condition at this point. And I think that's the challenge that a lot of people face in trying to trust themselves with the symptoms is they're normalized as mental health disorders or, or other conditions. No one's talking about this. We don't have the research to prove to prove what's just a theory at this point, but, but we all have these experiences with mold being so deadly and humans have survived this far without mold making them extinct and now it's like well maybe now's the time yeah and so many people describe walking past a mold colony and feeling it hidden inside a wall and when you describe that to a doctor or researcher they go oh that's impossible i mean if if there were any spores coming out it would be dispersed it would be all over the place you wouldn't feel it like you were walking past something hot I mean, it, that's just not possible. Maybe, maybe if you had a really discreet mold colony and you could see it, there could be enough spores coming off it that you could get close to it and kind of point at it. But your description of a hidden mold colony where there's a barrier and yet you can feel it anyway, that's outrageous. That's just beyond belief. Now, a scientist's job is to respond to observation try to explain things that don't make sense. But you can see that every time that people explain that, they dismiss it because it doesn't make sense, rather than asking themselves, is there any possible mechanism by which that could be true? And people really misinterpret your approach in, in calling out researchers and doctors. It's not like you're trying to start a war with all of them, but you're literally calling them all, all out for failing to have medical curiosity and be a medical detective, which is supposed to be part of their job. And instead they just defer to, well, if we haven't had a, set, a study to prove what you're saying, then we can't listen to you, which seems so backwards. I feel like they should be learning from their patients. Somebody Yeah, it's very anti-science. So we have um, Anna Martell, who says, I got gradually more and more sick after moving to the US, specifically Pacific Northwest, human climate and drywall construction, CIRS confirmed by a shoemaker certified doctor in 2020. The only time I felt good here is 06 to 08 in Boston in a clean brick building. In Eric's opinion, to what extent is drywall a factor versus a humid climate? 
I feel better when I travel outside the US, but only in a relatively dry continental climate, not on the coast. I got sick as a child living in cold coastal climate abroad, but recovered quickly after leaving. She notes that um, no drywall in the cold coastal climate. So I think the question is, you know, what environmental concerns it should she be concerned about? Like what's, to what extent is drywall a factor versus a human climate? Well, we know that the spores are so durable that they can withstand being processed right into sheetrock. So you can buy brand new sheetrock and it's just a disaster waiting for a water leak. And that really helped spread this phenomenon all over the place because researchers weren't aware of this and you could uh, build a brand new building and everything's fine for a while and then just either condensation or uh, a pinhole water leak in a copper pipe even just being in, in the north wall uh, a lot of the houses the area that acts up when you can't find any water leaks at all is the north cold wall because that's where the greatest condensation occurs. And it turns out that stachybotrys requires cellulose to metabolize, to produce its toxins. When they first started studying it, they tried isolating it, putting it in a Petri dish, and said, this stuff isn't toxic at all. It turns out that it had to be grown on the proper substrate in order to be able to produce these powerful toxins. And that is hay and straw, cellulose, rotted wood, paper, <laughs> drywall. So then there was one more complicating factor on top of that, that if toxic mold or a toxin producing mold, toxigenic mold, doesn't have a reason to produce it, it won't switch on its mechanisms to do so. It's metabolically expensive to produce this stuff and if it has no need, apparently it doesn't do so. So it requires a stimulus of another chemical or a microbe or some competing mold, something to tell it, we've got a problem here, it's time to switch into toxin production. So all these are complicating factors as to why not all sheetrock is bad. And sometimes it can be so bad that one small corner of a house will, will act up like the, the north wall. But in terms of climate, for a while there, they thought, well, since water is the problem, the more humid and damp the climate, the more the, you're gonna have a problem. And we didn't see that strong of a correlation. It turned out stachybotrys required more moisture than you would typically get even in a humid climate. It took a lot to keep it going. And the heating and ventilation systems in Las Vegas were perfect for that. So uh, in contrast to the theory that, well, Florida will obviously be the worst place on earth. No, it turns out that some of the sickest buildings were in the high desert in Las Vegas. So these complicating factors require that we need to look beyond just trying to blame this on water in general and humid climates. You've got to look for the specific conditions and understand how this darn mold operates. And if you look at it from the point of view, if you turn yourself into a mold spore and think like a, like a mold colony would, then it all falls into a pattern and you can make sense of it. Think like mold, that's great advice, Eric. <laughs> I have a question. Go ahead. Eric, this is related to Stacky. Can you hear me? Yeah. I hear you. Okay, um, thank you. So um, there are members of the mold community who um, are very frightened of stacky, and some are early in mold avoidance, uh, are, are out of the home that made them ill, and uh, trying to mold avoid on the road, and are highly sensitized and there's a few who have expressed this, where wherever they go, they're sensing stacky or frequently 
coming across what feels like stacky to them. And then there's, and then feel there's a cross contamination between that exposure in the store or on items that are purchased. And then they're, they're bought themselves or what they're bringing into the vehicle they feel it contaminates the vehicle, and then there's a lot of fear around there possibly being stacky spores in the vehicle, contaminating the vehicle, possibly growing a colony in the vehicle, and there's um, confusion about that and how to decontaminate a vehicle if the person feels that stacky has contaminated it. And from what I've learned, from other experienced avoiders and just in general it's it's been some experienced avoiders use a detailer to clean the car or soap and water or water um a lot also going into good air airing it out sunning and um there's still some confusion but so i wondered if you could speak to that and um because i haven't heard anything from the you or the experienced avoiders of specifically focusing on stacky when we discuss cross-contamination. Cross-contamination usually is a more broad encompassing term for different things we might be encountering. And I haven't seen specific focus on stacky contaminating things and how to decon stacky cross-contamination. Well, when this paradigm first emerged, in the late 1980s, early 1990s, the way we were gathering information was by sensitized people going to the mold colony that was making them sick and getting a Ziploc bag and taking it to the doctor and say, doctor, you got to help me with this crap that's killing me. And if they tested what was in the bag, stachybotrys kept showing up. And it's really fascinating that as soon as testing was invented, where they'd go in and well, we, with our microscopes, we can find this mold and that mold and another one. And we're finding all kinds of mold. And all of a sudden, people are saying, they're being told, well, what we found the most of was aspergillus. So it's probably aspergillus making you sick. And that completely skewed the way the information was being gathered. And stachybotrys, which had stood out so strongly when people were using their senses, got buried under experts saying, well, we find everything. We find mold is everywhere. We find penicillium. You know, we find so many molds. I don't know why you're focused, you're fixating on this stupid stacky botrys when mold is everywhere. Well, doctor, because we used our senses to isolate the one damn mold that was kicking our butts beyond anything else. And that was the mold that was doing it. And you can see to this day, that if you try to explain to them in those terms, they will argue with you and they will revert back to, well, our testing shows that mold is everywhere, so we don't know what you're talking about. But stachybotrys did show up in a really big way as a butt kicker, and every study of stachybotrys confirms this stuff is bad. There's something special about it. They're making a big mistake by using their tests to overrule our observations, our sensitivity, and diminish this until it's not even worth looking at. Because I think it's doing something that they don't understand. And what they don't understand is that it's incorporating nanoparticles. Mold produces Eric, nanoparticles, you, pardon? Will you talk a little bit about, um, because I, I don't know exactly who Elizabeth is referring to about people struggling, but I do have an idea who she could be referring to. And I'm wondering if part of this person's issue who might be in hypersensitivity is maybe reacting to like their own breath or even plastic things that have some of the bad stuff on it. So I was just interrupting you to ask if you could maybe talk a little bit about that both sure, of those I'm, things. I'm kind of because, working my way around to that. Oh I'm sorry for interrupting. <laughs> because the nanoparticles have that quality of sticking to everything. That's why they use them in cloud seeding. These little puppies they glom onto things by submolecular surface energy bonds, chemical bonds, and they are not dislodged. 
You cannot mechanically clean them. Once they stick to something, they are there for the duration. So this idea that you can clean up something by washing it or blowing it off, that never worked for me. Not even close. My first experiments were to try washing the crap out of plastic and metal objects, and I found I was reacting to them anyway. Mm -hmm. And of course, the doctor said, well, that's impossible. You remove the spores and fragments. So therefore, if you think you're reacting, it's a psychological problem. It's all in your head. Well, if you think about what nanoparticles can do, here's a mechanism by which this toxin could not only do exactly what I say, I mean, stick to things beyond imagination and not be cleaned up, but you could conceivably carry a nanoparticle contaminated object into a new location. And as these nanoparticles break down and are released, you could sense them. Remember, these things will go right through your lungs and into your brain and we can feel it. So when people are worried about the contamination of Stachybotrys, my crazy theory, and remember this is just a crazy stupid theory, <laughs> is that what we're really sensing is the vector, the nanoparticle, and that these do contaminate in a really huge way. We are kind of fortunate in that they are so sticky, they have such attractive properties that once you take something into a, a location, it will stick firmly so that if you get lucky, you can remove that object and the source of contamination goes with it. You've taken it out. It's not like dust that blows around interminably. These things like to stick to things. That's what nanoparticles do. They stick really, really hard. So on one hand, in early in the game, when a mold is still emitting nanoparticles, it's going to contaminate everything and it's going to be a pain in the butt. But it's the subsequent generation of exposure where once it's glommed onto something, then it's going to be adhering to specific items. And if you can isolate them and get them out of your environment, you can very well solve your problem just by doing that with no cleaning at all. Now, I, I would park in bad places, my, my car, and I realized, well, <laughs> I'm reacting to the chassis, to the bumper where there's accumulations of dirt, I can, I can get close to certain areas where more of this toxic substance is stuck to my vehicle on the outside. I can't wash the whole thing. I can't detail. I can't possibly remove it from the windings of the motors, the electric motor. It's, it's just too much. All I can do is act in a preemptive way to try to stay out of contamination zones. And when I must go into them, count on this effect where it's gonna to stick to something really hard. So I take my, you know, I get out of my vehicle, I drop my clothes, I take a shower so my clothes can stay outside and I park my vehicle at a distance away from my safe sleeping zone so it won't affect me while I recover at night. And that is much more fun than spending my life trying to wash something that cannot be washed. And do you find that the, um, the car, that the um, nanoparticles, the cross-contamination will die down in the car as well over time in good air? Yeah, I found that even when I identified stachybotrys, the bulk of the toxic effect would go away after about four days. Mm -hmm. sometime between four days and a week. So I had a very miserable four days to a week while I was waiting for it. But by establishing a safe zone and keeping the bulk of the contamination out of my sleeping area, I had a respite. I had a, a refuge where I could at least get a couple hours break where don't, before I'd have to use my vehicle again or put on my outside clothing and go back to work. And that's what kept me going. But adopting this weird lifestyle, seeing how it stuck so strongly to things, how it had this amazing characteristic, that got me interested because I'm going, what on earth could possibly do this? It's not acting the way the experts say it is. It's not acting like dust. It's acting more like 
highly charged particulate fragments, supercharged. I mean, supercharged to the point where these microscopic molecules are like miniature capacitors. They are so full of an electrical charge that they do seem to possess that a, this effect where just like people who are electro, electrically hypersensitive, if you get too close to a colony or an accumulation of this stuff, it sets you off in the same way that um, a strong electrical field can do. So that's where I think that researchers have really dropped the ball is because they're not looking at the supercharging effect of nanoparticles. They're not incorporating this into their theories, into their studies, into their beliefs. And this makes them incapable of re reacting in a cogent and lucid manner to your description of being able to sense this because in their world, that's unbelievable. It doesn't fit their mental profile. It doesn't fit what dust can do. So it goes out the window and no matter how many times they hear it, they dismiss it each time just as readily as they did the first time they heard it. So what we have to do is use people like Keeley, who said, no, I felt this independently of Eric's crazy theory. I didn't even believe it. And yet my <laughs> observations told me that here was something that didn't fit what the experts are telling me. And we need more people to go, yeah, this is an observation that we can make. And just because it doesn't fit the belief system of, of experts, this isn't a reason to dismiss it. This is the reason we should be looking into it. I so agree, Eric, thank you. And I just wanted to recap what you said. So for those who are sensing specifically stacky, that the approach is to remove oneself, avoid the bad locations. If you have to go into it, when you return to the good location, park away from the safe sleeping area, decon oneself, and one may feel bad for a few days until the vehicle, the nanoparticles in the vehicle denature and the car shifts to feeling better. I think that's one of the things that has been um, difficult for some mold avoiders is the fact of feeling so bad. And then they're, they're prompted to, they feel like they have to do something in order to um, fix it or um, clean it up. Afraid that if they don't, it'll make them sicker having it around. But I understand from what you're saying that it'll denature on its own. Yeah, but, I believe but, that the uh, supercharging of the molecules, they are so highly oxidative that these nanoparticles actually burn themselves out. They're like mm -hmm. miniature sparklers. And we can capitalize on this. People think that um, mold contamination is forever, and I haven't found it to be so. Mm. I find that a fresh contamination has a its major toxic value, goes away fairly quickly, and then there's a lingering value. And that lingering effect seems to be as the residual accumulations of what I believe are nanoparticles are still burning themselves out, releasing from where they stick to something, getting the air, and then that's where we breathe them in, get them into the lungs, they sail into the brain, and our brain goes, what the hell is this? Mm -hmm. Like- um, That makes sense, yeah. Like people say, well, it feels like stachybotrys, so therefore it is stachybotrys. Well, yeah, in a way that's correct, because it's an effect from stachybotrys, but we haven't completely elucidated all the mechanisms of what this stachybotrys is doing. And it may be that this vector, this nanoparticle effect, it occurs in other molds as well. But I believe it's stronger in stachybotrys because you're combining it with a more powerful neurotoxic substance. Eric, 
Eric, can you talk more about like exposure, like different exposures? Because Keely's going through it right now where she's reacting to her water. And what, how does that relate to mold exposure? Well, during the Tahoe outbreak, I did a lot of water experiments where I was reacting to my sink. And I go, wow, what, what, and there's no water in it. What's going on here? How can the drain affect me so badly? I, I got into arguments with people because I'm going, the pea trap must have dried out. It must be broken because some kind of toxin is coming out of the sewer system, coming straight up through the sink. And I, I would actually dismantle the pea trap and go, no, it's, it's working. It's still here. What's going on? What, what can go through the water? And so I went to other sinks other water supplies, like um, in the laundry room, the exhaust for the uh, washing machine, just a vertical pipe going down to a P-trap, I was reacting to that too. So in my mind, there is something coming off the surface of the water that I could react so strongly to that if I were to inhale it, I would drop, I would hit the floor in about a minute. I mean, I literally could not stand up. I was so hypersensitized to something in the water and thinking about the ultrafine particles, the silver iodide particles being dispersed on my location. It was natural for me to think that, yeah, these nanoparticles are getting into the water and that's what I'm reacting to. I went out to um, a camper that I had, an old camper, which didn't have a water supply in it. Any water that I wanted to bring was in a, a sealed bottle because there was no water supply. So I went out to my camper and found, wow, I feel so much better out here. And I would try bringing in bowls of water to my camper to see if I could reproduce the sink effect. And as long as I had plenty of water in a open receptacle, there was no problem. But if I dried it out, all of a sudden something was released. So what is it about the drying process that made something in the water bioavailable, whereas in its bulk form, the water was holding it in place and I wasn't inhaling it? There again, it seemed to be that the nanoparticle hypothesis fit this profile as the uh, water dries out, you've got greater surface area and all these accumulations of nanoparticles are breaking down and they're releasing into the air. And that's what you can feel when you're directly in front of what formerly was a water supply. So being out, having a, a camper that had no water supply, no shower, that actually, it, I was lucky, that really saved me because I, I could tell that Something about the drying of the water was releasing this. And there again, this is all crazy stuff, but the more I read about um, cyanotoxins, microcystin, it turns out that this is exactly what happens in uh, cyanobacterial exposures. That the spores, the toxins, the fragments are all contained in the water and they tend not to be in the air until you dry them out. The drying of the sink, a, a person who's sensitized to cyanotoxins will react to a dry sink more than they will to a sink full of this toxin. So this put me in mind of this family that died hiking on the Merced River with the anatoxin A the harmful algal blooms because they all dropped in the same place at the same time after getting close to what is known to be a harmful algal bloom. So I, they tested the water in their camelback and they did not pick up any water. So it was an ingestion problem. And my belief is that this weakened their lungs defenses probably made them more susceptible to hypothermia, but it wasn't the hypothermia that killed them. 
I think that the, the anatoxin A set them up so they were literally running out of oxygen. These people, after exposure to this harmful larger bloom, they couldn't breathe. And that's exactly what was happening to me with the sink and the effect that I was feeling in the water. And exposure to that, and I was knocked out for hours afterward. And so I think this is possibly what's happening on a global scale right now, is, is these nanoparticles, human production of industrial nanoparticles fills the atmosphere, it's getting into the water supply, and it has finally reached a point where we can feel fluctuations of nanoparticles as they pass through the water system. And you were able to remedy that through boiling your water, right? Because I'm just thinking about people who are living in their cars or living in trailers and they're going everywhere and they're exposed to different water supplies, right? So you were able to remedy that through simply boiling? Yeah, I uh, asked cyanobacteria researchers, will boiling remove the cyanotoxins? They said, absolutely not. It will, in fact, it will make more of them because if you rupture the spores that have the toxins, it will increase your exposure. It will release it into the water, but it won't denature it because they're stable up to a much higher temperature than boiling is. So you cannot remove cyanotoxins by boiling. And I'm going, okay, perhaps not. But what if it's the nanoparticle vector that's actually making this bioavailable? Could oxidizing the water, boiling it, shaking up the molecules, reduce the ability of the nanoparticle to serve as a vector transport system so that even though the cyanotoxins are still there, they're no longer bioavailable? So I proceeded to test the experiment, and I found that if I boiled all my water, if I brought nothing but boiled water into my mobile environmental control unit, the effect, the toxic effect, was reduced. So I've tried running this past researchers, and they tell me that I'm absolutely crazy because as far as they are concerned, in their literature, boiling does not reduce cyanotoxin exposure. So therefore, whatever I claim is impossible, and that's the reason not to look into it. Eric, I have a question. Uh, you, you mentioned that you felt knocked out by um, the cyanotoxin, the nanoparticles. Um, I am, and I've seen other mold avoiders express being exposed to a particular toxin that makes us feel, it's almost a narcoleptic response like an overwhelming all of a sudden I have to go to sleep immediately like right now I must go to sleep right now and then go to sleep and then you know I've even it's happened to me where I was in the toxin in the area with the toxin it hit me and it was so bad that I couldn't leave I had to I had to pull over and sleep and that gave me enough like I guess enough repair or something that when I woke up, I was better enough to be able to drive out of there. I just wanted to share that. And I, I thought that was either cyanobacteria that I, I've run into or the fire retardant associated toxin. I suspect that that's anatoxin A. Mm -hmm. Uh, because it's so powerful, and I mean, it puts you to sleep so quickly. Yeah. No, and don't call it narcolepsy, because well, no, that's I when, know. That's when yeah. I mean, if you tell a doctor that, they say, "Oh, well, you shouldn't have a driver's license because you could fall asleep all you." But no, we've got actually we we have time to pull off and go. Oh boy, I'm really knocked out. Yeah. Now it's so bad that if you keep yeah. driving, yeah, you might fall asleep. But uh, mm -hmm. it, it's not, we, we have a little bit more warning than that. But yeah, I felt that all the time. Yes, we do. And I ran into that quite a bit going down Highway 80 near the Truckee River. And I was able to tell at times when I could feel it 
when it was stronger, when the road, when Highway 80 got closer to the river. And this was mm -hmm. at the same time when there was an algal bloom going on up at Boca Reservoir. Mm. And I went up there and got pictures of it. Wow. And yes, I could feel that effect where the green algal bloom was occurring. And I described this to Dr. Shoemaker, and he goes, what the hell are you doing? Are you crazy? You, you know that that's where the toxin is coming from, but you go there looking for it? And then he said, sounds like something I would do. <laughs> this even happened to me. Um, I was, ex I mostly camp and occasionally I'll stay in, in, in a hotel, very, very rarely. But this particular time I stayed in a and b and it was in a good town that I, I felt good in overall. And at first the B and B felt okay. There were a couple of problematic areas, but I was still okay in my room. And it was nice to have a shower and a bed for a couple of nights. The owner had gone to Santa Fe and came back. And when she came back, she went into her kitchen, which was the, uh, the one of the problematic areas that I didn't go in the kitchen because it didn't feel good to me. But um, I had paid her and then she went in her kitchen and she was chatting with me and I stood in, a, in the doorway of the kitchen and the combination of her in the kitchen knocked me out. I had this, my brain started melting and I ended the conversation. I made it upstairs just in time to lay down and pass out. I had that overwhelming, I have to go to sleep right now. And, and, and I had to sleep for a few hours. I could feel it happening in my brain. I would wake up, just, you know, come to just enough consciousness to feel my brain struggling. And then I would just go back under. It was an amazing, powerful effect. Just being, in, being near someone who had been, she had been in Santa Fe, which is known to have a few toxins, including cyanobacteria. Yeah, in 2010, I ran into a situation where uh, a friend of mine had a sewer problem and they had to rebuild the, uh, the uh, sewage lift pump in their house. And from then on, I couldn't get near him. If I got within five feet of him, it would knock me out. So he would come in and sit at his desk and I couldn't go near his desk. Mm. And then the carpet under where he sat, I was reacting to that. So I'd have to walk around that area. I would have to avoid that area of the carpet. Well, I wound up walking through the area and it got on my boots. And that effect mm. was so powerful that bringing my boots into my mobile environmental control unit filled the air with this incredible effect where, as you say, it would knock me out and I'd have to go to sleep. And after a couple hours, I'd recover. Mm. And after reproducing this effect a couple of times where I could deliberately recreate this with my, my boots, I'm going, wow, this is some incredibly powerful stuff. And I wanted to keep samples of it. So I you know, put it in jars and I'm all excited because I'm gonna take it to researchers and we're gonna figure this out. And as you know, that was 11 years ago. And they go, well, you're just crazy. You're, we're not even gonna talk to you. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's the stuff, it's amazing. For it yeah. to be so powerful that you can you can transport it to another location and it can fill the air and it can make a small room feel like a bad like a sick room like you know there's got to be the worst toxic mold growing in that place when you know by the circumstances somebody just carried it in on their clothing. Mm -hmm. And 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 again, in your when that happened you just let it just denatured over the next few days and it was fine. You didn't have to, you, I'm sure you removed your boots, but you just let it uh, die down and then it was okay again. This stuff did not die down so quickly. I okay. had to keep my boots outside. I left them in the sun for months and they did not die down. Mm. And some of the objects that were in that location they didn't die down and I washed them and I washed them and they just did not get better. So yeah, there was something out there that kind of breaks the rules 
and it does mm. not clean up and it lasts forever. Mm. And how, and what happened with your MECU with that being inside? Like I say, it seemed to stick so strongly that once I mm -hmm. got the source point out, it was the, the, the emanator, the emitter of mm -hmm. this terrible thing. Mm -hmm. It left once I, mm -hmm. once I identified what it, it had come in on and removed it. And that mm -hmm. got rid of 90% of it or more. But I could, I could tell by the way I experimented with some objects that did not die down, that if I had brought these into my environment and left them there, I probably would have committed suicide a long time ago. Because, I mean, uh, it, was, it was completely disabling. Hey, Eric, Jen wanted to ask you a question. Yes. Mm -hmm. And she wanted to know, she said that I see a lot of chatter in the mold avoidance communities about there being no good places left. That hasn't been my experience. I found some places to be very bad, but a lot of good in between. But maybe it's because I've healed and am no longer as sensitive. Wonder what Eric thinks about the ratio of good to bad places left. When people are so reactive to these source points, they uh, think that every place is bad. You just, you never get a break. You are so sensitized and so close to the edge that you are reacting to any chemical VOCs. And so it just feel like, feels like the world is closing in on you. But my experience was that the more, the better you get at mold avoidance and the more you hone in on this one particular effect as being the problem, and the more you deal with that, all the secondary problems melt away. And my tolerance has increased so much now as a result of paying attention to this one particular effect that I routinely go into the worst possible places, the areas that used to just knock me out. And I can actually be there for a couple hours and I might have to decontaminate, but I don't have to live in the fear that I did of dragging microscopic amounts in on my clothes and on my hair the way I, I did 10 years ago. Can you just talk about maybe give an example of maybe someone who's more novice and doesn't really understand how to locate something bad? Maybe can you give an example of something and how to figure out if something is bad and then what to do with it? Well, the way I did it was by realizing that there were these places that had an overwhelming toxic exposure that just knocked me out for so long and that it was stuck to objects that had been in that location. And I took contaminated objects out camping with me so that when I got clear, when I felt better, I could go near them and see what effect they had on me. And bit by bit, I trained myself to associate the subtle sensations of how I reacted to those objects with the worst toxin. And over time, just by practice, I honed in on a specific breathing effect that made these contaminated objects stand out from your standard, normal chemical exposures. And that is when you encounter a chemical irritant, it's harmful on the first breath. The first time you take it into your lungs, that initial uptake of air, you'll sense it. This was different. This was a little peculiar. I would come near a contaminated object, and as I bring it close to my face, the first breath had no effect. Nothing. I couldn't feel at all. And that's very odd because if I know something's toxic to me, the first time I inhale it, it it's going to be bad, right? This, this breaks the rules. I would inhale, exhale, and then on the re-inhalation, that's when it hit me. So I realized, or I came to the crazy conclusion that the breathing process was part of what was unveiling this 
bioavailability of this toxin to my lungs. And this is not like any normal chemical. So if I look for this effect, I can differentiate this rebreathing effect of this really bizarre property, separate it from all the other exposures where, oh, that's just a normal, I breathe some gas fumes and it's an irritant, it's bothersome the first time I inhale it. Yeah, that's bad, but that's not the really killer stuff that knocks me out for so long. It's this rebreathing effect that really stands out and makes the, uh, what I call the bad stuff different from everything else. Does anyone else have any final questions as we wrap up here? We're going to end at 11.30 uh, PST. So if anyone has any last minute questions, that'd be great. I was just going to probe Eric to talk a little bit more about what are you sensing when you do the rebreathe on items to sensory contamination and then like to incorporate into the answer, when you were first recovering, were the symptoms different in any way to how they are now when you're rebreathing on something? Um, I have more tolerance now, but the base value of what I sense is still very much the same and that what I'm looking for is heart palpitations. Not necessarily an increase in heart rate, but just the laboring of the heart, which tells me that the capillaries are shutting down, my lungs are shutting down. It's trying to stop something bad from getting in. So, um, yeah, I'll, I will sense brain compression and fatigue and uh, depression and other things later but the initial thing that I'm looking for is straight up heart palpitations, the pounding of the heart. And what do I think it is? Well, remember with the silver iodide, what, what makes the magic happen? How does it work? It's the attractive qualities of these dense particles, the surface energy. They're like little super magnets. I think that's what I'm reacting to. I think that what I'm reacting to even more than the toxin itself is the body senses the surface re energy of nanoparticles as a threat. And it tries to protect you by shutting down the lungs. And the more doctors look for toxins, the more baffled they will be because this is not any kind of, kind of classic toxin. This doesn't fit into their concepts of toxicology. So they're completely missing the boat. This is a physiological response to the surface charge, the extremely irritating oxidative power of these dense charged miniature capacitors, these nanoparticles in my crazy world. Now, I've, I've explained this to top researchers and they look straight at me and say, you are absolutely out of your mind. So I'm not gonna go out acting like this is a proven fact, or I've substantiated this. I believe that nanomedicine is a strong suggestion that there's some basis for this theory, but uh, I don't wanna go off saying that I've got this thing solved when right now this is just my crazy speculation. I have one question before you guys go, if it's all right. I'm actually at the moment headed back to the house that tortured and changed my life around. And um, my family gutted out the kitchen cabinets that the inspector said the mold was and in the kitchen ceiling. Um, my mother is telling me, swearing up and down that the place, there's no mold. I'm actually making an attempt to go back to the same home that really turned my life upside down. I'm really extremely scared to do it. Um, I guess the, the I guess I'm facing just another exposure. If I do so, I'll be able to. But what caught my attention um, is what you said, Eric. Um, um, if, the, if the source of the, the mold is removed, 
let's just say it was the cabinets, right? Do you think that my house is safe now? Do you think, like, like the what if the contamination, because all the furniture, she said, was blown out, but the carpeting is all there, and it's from first floor to the second. And I told my mother that's the worst, that's the first thing on the list that can't be around after a contamination. And um, long story short, she said, if we got to remove the carpeting, then that's what we'll do. We'll do it all flooring. So I'm actually a block away, and I'm about to put the, my body to the test. Um, my question is, um, within a matter of time, will that contamination after the removal, would that go away? Because you were mentioning that, that happening in vehicles. Would, would that same thing ha have an effect on homes? I don't think so, right? Because there's less movement in a home going on or ventilation. But my family is trying to say that they did a lot of deep, thorough cleaning. But they're not really professionals. They're not more professionals, you know. They're maintenance. They're Manhattan maintenance supervisors. So they think they're just cleaning stuff the regular, basic way. We'll do it. So I'm here now. I'm 100 feet away from the home. And I'm about to take the biggest risk of my life. As I am so fed up, literally living out of my vehicle. As you can see, I'm growing a beard. I never even grew a beard in my life. But I've been got, I've gotten to the point where Eric was talking about where I'm literally avoiding every single place that gives me that reaction. Like when I walk in a deli and I see it, the door open, I go in for that quick black coffee as I'm doing intermittent fasting. That split second contaminates my clothes and I can tell it has to come off or it has to stay on me. And if it's a light contamination, I keep it on me. But lately, it's been a lot, a lot, a lot of changing and decontaminating. And look, she has the place already um, airing out. Um, what do I do here? Um, do I like, let me change my camera. So this is the home that is mold infested. Yeah, you stop outside and you assess how you feel and so just get a sense of hour. how desperate you are. And as you approach and breathe, just report back on how it, how it affects you. There it goes. Oh, yeah. Hi, Mom. So this is the kitchen? Yes. Very, very, um, um, highly professional uh, mold experts. Um, and I told them about it. Where was the mold that was removed from the ceiling? It moved. I can't really hear. I'm not feeling it. Hear my you guys can hear? It, it'll take a matter of time till I start feeling it. No, guys. Um, we we threw out. Can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, hear yeah, yeah. We can hear you. Let me shut this off, Mom. I, I can't believe I don't feel it right now. This is this is really tripping me out. <laughs> This is too good to be true right now. There's no possible way. You said they repainted the whole house. Yes. Was the mold repellent paint? Never. Oh, yeah. It's not like a gorgeous and a pray away. A pray on that good job. Barbie step. Because the inspector said it was in the kitchen cabinets and he yeah. said in the ceiling. But, but the point is, is you're not feeling it right now. Basically, I'm not feeling it, but I'm on a colonica <laughs> and I'm thinking that's masking it up. You're what? I'm thinking it's I'm masking it because I'm already on a, 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 on, on, on a set. I'm on a sedative. Um, is it is is it safe to say I can run the air conditioner, Eric? Uh, the way I have to live is take everything as it comes. I I live moment by moment. You know, like, I, I said in, in, in running, after she yeah, make this book, Mold actually. Warriors, that I have to treat this exactly like a peanut allergy. Yes. Like a complete peanut allergy. 
Now, look how, look how this is what terrifies me, the carpeting. Um, you see how much carpeting this is here? Like, like you would never think this home is I'm moldy. Like, like this is what, this is, guys, this is what I torture myself in the streets. And this is what I avoid, a beautiful home, just because of what it did to me. Like, look at the, look at what. I, look what I lived. I lived on in tents and beaches, and this is the room that changed my life. Like, literally, I got so deathly ill from this room right here. Yeah, and, L and, and I honestly, I kind of think I feel it in here. To be honest with you, Luigi, we're gonna wrap it up here, okay. um, and and everyone else who's joined us today, thank you so much for coming along and just listening to, um, what do we call Eric? Eric Gump? <laughs> Master Eric. Um, you know, <laughs> the all-knowing one that, that really understands mold and avoidance and has been dealing with this his entire life. And we're just so very grateful for him to give his time, oh. you know, effortlessly to helping. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, thank you, for real. And uh, so we're, we're doing this every month. Thank you so um, much. This should be done every day. Uh, this should be done every day, Alicia. Come on now. Yeah, Especially I wish we could do this every day. <laughs> I know. I, I wish we could, you know. But uh, <laughs> you guys can always reach us on uh, Facebook Messenger, Instagram, DMs, our email. We always put it out there. This um, was very, so very, very, very helpful. This was very yeah. helpful. Good, yeah, and that, that's the whole point of why we wanted to do live Q&A. So um, again, tune in next month. It'll be around the same date, um, same time, and then um, just you know start building your question list now and bring it to the next session. So thanks everyone, have a good day. We'll see you next time. And check out our mold shirts. We have our mold warrior t-shirts. I'm gonna put them on sale next week for Halloween, so Keep your eyes peeled for that. We're trying to offload our inventory and bring in some new inventory. And uh, yeah, we'll move from there, guys. Thank you so much again. Wishing awesome. good health. Awesome by me. And, and uh, hope you're able to navigate <laughs> your sensitivities. Thank you. See you next month. Bye. <laughs>